Welcome to the fifth evening on curbing war and building peace in our century. Thank you for continued interest. Um, tonight, uh, you'll have a bit more time for discussion, questions and answers and observations that you may have. And I thought uh, it would be good to start with a map of the problem areas in the world. Many people think uh, that the risk of war is uh, particularly great among the powerful countries with the largest uh, military machines and the greatest ambitions and the strongest competitive positions in the world power system. But I think it is not so much overwhelming power as tremendous weakness, uh, which uh, has a high risk of uh, leading uh, to uh, political violence. Um, the very large and powerful countries know what it is to uh, go to war. Unpredictable, extremely destructive, particularly with their large military machines and their weapons of mass destruction. So the United States and China and Russia and India and other big powers uh, will be very hesitant to go to war against each other. Not that they are peaceful. Uh, they are every day in competition against each other. Um, and the world is really still a very competitive power system. And some people explain the way it works by the theory of regional hegemony. It is these big ones which more or less order the things around them. I'm not excluding the risk that in this century the big ones will uh, get entangled in very serious fights. But as the world is now, and for the last 20, 30 years, the risks of war are among the smaller countries, the weaker ones, the less integrated, uh, where there is a high incidence of political violence, of governments against their populations, of population groups against each other, of neighboring states, uh, particularly uncertainty of the power situation and the distribution and the opportunities to challenge each other and challenge the government uh, and correct frontiers um, are serious risks of political violence, of war. There's a, uh, an organization in the United States called the Fund for Peace, which finances every year um, the so-called uh, failed or fragile states map. Um, I'll show you in a minute uh, on what kind of measurements this is based. And this uh, fragility map shows what the weakest and most uncertain places are in the world. And they coincide with many other maps. The world <coughs> hunger map, the map of prevalent diseases, uh, the map of great political risks for foreign investors. And you see here what the map looked like for last year. Um, the new map for 2016 will be issued in the course of this year. And you see that the trouble spots um, are particularly in Africa, but also in South Asia. The more red, the more worrisome life is there, the shorter life expectancy, the higher the political risk. And the more blue, uh, the more stable and sustainable. This is not a pronouncement on, let's say, the quality of the government or the quality of life, but it has a correlation with it. You see that countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Northwestern Europe, the Netherlands, Germany, Ireland, Portugal are the best places to live uh, with the lowest risk of uh, uh, large-scale political violence and uh, the most stable societies. 
you see, there is not all that much reason to be extremely critical uh, of the place we happen to live in. Everything is relative. Uh, one can live in much worse countries. Um, what is this based on, of course? Let's take a look. Uh, this is a list of indicators that they calculate to make this map. It's a bit difficult uh, for you to read it all, but um, I have it uh, anyway on one sheet. It consists of social, economic, political and military indicators, which are all of them quite logical that they uh, measure these things. And then just like the uh, World Peace Index, which I showed uh, the first evening, um, come to a, a com composite calculation you find in their publication, which is simply online and also leads every year to a magazine article in the magazine uh, Foreign Policy magazine in the United States, which is the more progressive counterpart of the more establishment-oriented um, quarterly uh, foreign affairs. Um, they give country by country the way they calculated this and also what risks uh, the authors expect in the countries concerned. So it's very interesting if you are interested in a particular country, if you want to go there or want to study it, to look up this uh, calculation uh, of the country concerned in, uh, on, on the site of the Fund for Peace. Many of the factors that you see here we dealt with the previous evenings. Um, factors which often by themselves do not cause any war, but they have correlations with the incidence of political violence, like uh, a high Gini coefficient, um, uh, like enormous uh, migration, um, like um, high corruption, uh, no press freedom, um, constant power struggles, um, you name it out of the previous evenings and it's uh, in this table one way or another. Let's look at the question which interests us most and that is what can be done to reduce the risk of political violence. And I return then to uh, the slides with which we uh, ended uh, last evening, the necessary forms for maintaining peace. And I started, you remember, at uh, the global level uh, with the veto right, uh, as it is first of all uh, the task of the United Nations Security Council uh, to maintain the peace, and it is often paralyzed because of the veto. Incidentally, if you have any remarks, questions, a different view, um, let's hear your view and interrupt me. We dealt with this already. Um, I'm not sure that any of these proposals, A, B or, or C, are really going to be adopted. Um, the willingness of the P5 to limit their own uh, strong influence on decisions uh, is of course very small. And the little thing that we as Europeans could do, merge the British and French veto, neither Paris nor London are ready to do that because it's the hallmark of, of their previous great power status. What is it to have only 60 million people as compared to India, which is outside the Security Council, which will be 1.7 billion in the course of this century. But the willingness to give up uh, uh, certain privileges in order to make the world organization uh, adjust to reality is very limited. So improvements in the Security Council have to be made step by step, little steps, uh, particularly of a procedural nature. That means that those who chair the Security Council, not the UN Secretary General, but the ambassador of the country which happens to be uh, chairing it, that rotates from country to country, 
has to be a very smart and a very good chair and clever in designing little steps forward uh, that uh, facilitate better decision making in the UN Security Council. Next to limiting the veto right, we need of course to improve the membership. We dealt with that the previous time. It is very strange that a country like India does not serve permanently on the Security Council. One could of, of course also think of increasing the membership from the present 15 to 20 or there are even some studies which say we have to go to 24, get the big regional leaders and uh, have many more members but without the veto right. Ideally would of course be to have some form of weighted voting like we have in the European Union on many questions. Uh, where there is an intricate balance uh, between the small and the big. Um, the big needs some small for a majority and the small cannot block the big permanently. What we also need is much more finance for peace operations. Um, now there is a formula for contributions to the United Nations um, which is based on the relative size of the country. So uh, the big ones uh, and the rich ones uh, contribute more. Um, the biggest paymaster is the United States and the United States often gets wary of uh, having to contribute so much and at the same time being so critical of uh, the United Nations. And it has a couple of times uh, refused to finance more and also pulled out temporarily, for instance from UNESCO, uh, when it thought that UNESCO was turning, turning too anti-Israeli um, and not reforming itself and its bureaucracy. It would be good if we would get much more finance for peace operations because they are extremely small in relation to the military expenses of the member states and the need for UN peace operations. And it would be very good if the UN were made more independent from all kinds of voluntary contributions. The UN often has to go head in hand to the member states to pay bills which cannot be paid for from the regular contributions. This became a very serious uh, question after the first large-scale peace operation in Congo, um, which was designed by Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld and took 25,000 people to help suppress uh, the um, civil war which broke out in 1960 there. And it left uh, an enormous um, debt which many countries refused to pay. So that made the UN hesitant for about 20 years to enter into new peace operations. So uh, something as simple as who pays the bill is very important. Sometimes you see that countries which are very reluctant to send military are less reluctant to pay bills. Like Japan is often a big financer of peace operations and like Persian Gulf states. While very uh, populous countries with large land armies like India and Pakistan then supply a lot of the personnel and interestingly the biggest supplier of troops now for the United Nations in Africa is China which originally was very critical of UN peace operations and interventions by the UN um, by the world community so to speak. China sees that its interest is in stability and helping Africa becoming less um, divided and uh, a victim of, uh, of violence. One could think of many forms of international taxation which not only would yield uh, additional money for the UN but also would perhaps uh, improve uh, consumption uh, improve the environment, um, but nothing of this has uh, yet been achieved. All these proposals you find under B 
you find in academic studies and non-governmental idealistic organizations and more left-wing political parties. But even in the European Union, it is very difficult uh, to get uh, real common international finance. You know the EU is financed by contributing a share, a very small portion of your uh, value-added uh, tax. Yes? Yes. IMF and World the Bank. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that would be an idea. IMF and World Bank are based on the capital contributions by the member states, in a way by the four ministers of finance. And they give voting rights according to the contributions. So they are quite different from the other uh, international organizations and a bit more run like a corporation with advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is that the United States contributes 15% um, of the capital, but also 15% of the vote. And it's up till now impossible to take a decision against uh, the American executive director in the, in the World Bank. Um, voting is often not done. You cannot conclude in an academic fashion from the voting behavior what the real power relations are because this is implicit influence. If, if the American executive director says, well, this is not a good idea, then other member states know we shouldn't push this further because uh, this is not a promising proposal. There's a lot of implicit arms wrestling there. Um, but formula are not difficult to design, indeed, uh, on the basis of, uh, of what countries contribute to the collective good of uh, maintaining peace. Um, moreover, by, in the case of IMF and World Bank, there is uh, considerable criticism from the newly emerging countries of not only Asia, uh, also Latin America, that it is too Western an organization uh, and dominated by uh, the United States, uh, Western Europe and Japan. Um, and it takes a lot of time to adjust the World Bank and the IMF to uh, the rise of China and India in the world economy and Brazil. It takes so much time that China got fed up with it and uh, established its own um, World Bank uh, last year. Now fortunately the World Bank uh, said uh, good for you, uh, that brings in more development capital for the world so you have our blessing. But it's to some extent in competition with the World Bank. Now if the World Bank economists who say they believe in competition uh, do believe in competition, they should indeed uh, welcome uh, a competing institution. Yes? Uh, for uh, foreign aid, for example, there is a, um, a treaty that all countries have to contribute to 0.7% of the GDP to aid. Is there something similar for peace or not at all? No. And I wish it were true what you said. It's not a treaty. It is a political agreement which is violated every year. The agreement, uh, which goes back to the work of the uh, Dutch economist Jan Timberge, uh, says that the uh, industrialized uh, countries should spend every year um, seven-tenths of one percent of their national income, so 0.7%. Uh, on um, helping to build up the poor countries. And he calculated that by making a simple calculation based on the capital need of these countries. His view of poverty was that it was a lack of investment capital and a lack of know-how. Now, unfortunately, it's more complicated, but still we need, of course, a lot of investment uh, in countries uh, which are problematic. Um, now, this 0.7% promise is not implemented. There are four or five countries who do so. 
um, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Luxembourg. The Netherlands used to do it till about three years ago um, and will, and, and then the new governments in the Netherlands, the, the last series of cabinets said, um, as the rest of the world is not sticking by this agreement and only doing half, on average about 0.35 percent, we are also going down. So it's been a subject of budget cutting in the Netherlands. Now, probably this year, we reach again this figure of 0.7, of 0.8 percent, and not because development aid is increasing, because of a bookkeeping trick. And the bookkeeping trick is to pay the costs of refugees and migrants who are taken in the Netherlands out of the development budget for the first year. And as it is per migrant or refugee about 25,000 euros per year, uh, that makes quite a bookkeeping difference. But it limits, of course, the actual foreign aid for poverty uh, uh, reduction in other countries. But you're right, it would be good if uh, there were some form of treaty and obligation for taking care of collective goods in the world, like poverty alleviation, uh, um, alleviation environmental care, uh, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, uh, improving the oceans, and so on and so forth. Uh, I've argued that what we would need is an overview of all these collective goods and their annual costs and then distribute the costs over the countries according to their financial, economic and demographic strength. Then you would get a fair amount of international taxation. This is far beyond what is possible. My rough calculation is that we would need about 1% of GMP of the rich countries actually fight poverty effectively. Um, about one and a half percent for the environmental purposes we want to strive for and an additional percentage for peacekeeping operations. So we would probably arrive at a new norm of two and a half percent or three percent. Um, there is no government which says fine thank you we are going to do that. Governments also argue amongst each other. The United States says to the Europeans, you do much too little for maintaining peace. Your contribution to the management of the international power system, to NATO, is much too small. We Americans pay per capita five times or ten times as much as you West Europeans. And the West Europeans argue, um, you Americans do much too little in the field of poverty alleviation. Uh, look at your official development assistance budget. That's the norm, 0.7%. Uh, you in the United States do only 0.15%, close to Switzerland and Italy. Um, and then the Americans argue, uh, well, look at our wealthy Americans, Bill Gates and others, who do much more than the wealthy Europeans. So this is... Um, making charges against each other leading nowhere. But if you sit down as an academic and you figure out what would really be necessary to make real progress, and it has been done for separate fields, you would, I think, arrive at a much higher percentage than the 0.7 percent. There's an American economist who has figured out, with a team of 250 other scholars, what it would cost to implement the new sustainable development goals. Uh, the 16 sustainable development goals and that is in the order of some 300 billion dollars a year, which sounds a lot, but it's only one-fifth of world defense expenditure. So it's all a matter of priorities. Um, so much is about finance. Um, what is also necessary is to form a sort of United Nations army. Now, the United Nations still has to collect 
troops from individual countries on the basis of uh, the so-called standby agreement, which is a list of military possibilities which the member states might contribute if their government decides so, if it happens to be free to be used in another country, and if <coughs> Parliament approves it. So that's a very uncertain basis, and as I said the previous time, it often takes three months of arguing before these are freed, and that is why it would be very good to have some arrangement where the United Nations can immediately call on certain forces. Such a thing was um, formed in the late 1990s on the basis of a Danish-Dutch proposal. It worked. It uh, did a very good job uh, in uh, the war uh, between Eritrea and Ethiopia. But then it um, was uh, abolished because some countries thought it cost too much. Um, one can also on a country basis not wait for the international community to agree on certain measures, but simply arrange your things in such a way that you can, uh, within 24 or 48 hours, say yes uh, to uh, requests. Um, and it's also possible to, of course, make agreements with Parliament that in certain urgent cases you can take rapid uh, decisions. Um, crucial is often airlift capacity, which is available uh, if you pay enough. Um, because there are all kinds of corporations and also armies in the world, air forces, which will be very happy to earn some money on the side by moving from A to B uh, enormous battalions. In the United Nations Charter, you find the possibility of a United Nations Army and even a United Nations Commander. There is a committee of um, generals of the major powers of uh, the Security Council, which meets to decide on peacekeeping operations. And the only thing it does is meet to decide that they don't want to discuss this and that they only agree on the next meeting. It is quite ridiculous, but it's a formality which already goes on now for um, some 70 years. And in reality, the, sec the Secretary General counts on voluntary contributions of member states. And then the uh, command of these UN troops is given to one of the countries with, relatively speaking, the biggest contribution. Usually, again, one of the big five, but not always. As the United States, as I said before, is very hesitant to bring its troops under UN, and the same applies to uh, Russia. And the interesting uh, situation is that China is less uh, hesitant now. While its doctrine is that the UN should not intervene in countries and should only be limited to regulating the relations among countries not intervene in civil wars. And in doctrine and reality often differ, and in this case it's a positive difference. There is a committee to uh, do the peace building afterwards. I submit to you that the military intervention in a country is often not the difficult question. The job can often be done in a couple of weeks, but then what? Who takes care of the mess after a government has been chased out of power, after criminal gang leaders have been locked up? Because there is not all of a sudden, naturally, a new government and an order in the state. And this peace building can take 10, 20, 30 years. Many countries fall back into war repeatedly, because there are no structures for peace. And peace is basically non-violent conflict settlement. 
conflicts. There are always conflicts everywhere where there are human beings. Just the question is how do you build peaceful conflict settlement mechanisms like we have in the Netherlands or in Germany or in Finland? If you can't settle your conflict by mediation, you go to a judge. <coughs> if, if the judge cannot rule on this um, and mediators cannot uh, solve this, then in the end it becomes a political conflict and you go to the polls and uh, you vote. Uh, so in the end there is a peaceful solution. It's not always a just f solution, but there is an end to the conflict. Now, in the United Nations, a peace-building organization was uh, made, but that peace-building organization has been very ineffective. Its first client, the first country high on the agenda of this peace-building organization, <coughs> peace-building committee was Burundi, after the bloodshed in 1994 and 1995, was similar to Rwanda, but on a smaller scale. And the United Nations thought that its new peace building committee would, could prove itself by taking this small case and building up peace in Burundi. Well, you've read the news, Burundi is uh, in very serious trouble, violent, um, ethnic strife, so it's not been a success. And there are many organizations involved in peace building, everybody on his own, in his own area, financial, labor, reconciliation, medical, and so on and so forth. It would be good to coordinate this much more in a strong peace-building organization. But this also is not a proposal that has a high chance of being implemented. The problem is not that it's difficult to think of solutions. The problem is in implementing the solutions. We have the International Criminal Court. It is still very weak, subject also to political pressure. Sometimes it's all of a sudden used very well, but the criticism of the International Criminal Court, or ICC as it is called, is that it only deals with uh, African trouble spots. And the United Nations Security Council has not been able to give the ICC the task to look after war, to investigate war crimes in, the, uh, in Syria, for instance. And this, of course, worsens the relations between African states and the ICC. Some of them want to pull out. And many others boycott it by letting uh, witnesses disappear uh, and simply ignoring what the ICC says. The ICC has uh, issued a, an arrest warrant uh, for the president of uh, Sudan. He has been accused, he's been indicted with very convincing documents of um, uh, having a policy of genocide against the people in Darfur. Uh, that means all governments connected to the ICC now have the obligation to arrest him if he sets foot on their country but he's received all over the world and nothing happens. Nobody has the guts to arrest him. Um, he carefully asked last year if he could visit the United Nations General Assembly in New York and the United States cleverly gave no answer. He understood this and remained home. Otherwise he would have been arrested on Kennedy Airport. And he doesn't visit the Netherlands or the legally orderly countries. He was received in Turkey. Uh, while Turkey criticized him tremendously, he was received in South Africa. You may remember from the news that in South Africa there was a whole debate. Should the man be shackled and sent to The Hague, nothing happened. It's still very difficult to arrest uh, government leaders who are indicted for war, war crimes. Now, 
The other level is of course below the global one. We have regional organizations in many areas in the world. And one could apply the same measures that were in the previous slides also at the regional level. Uh, world politics is simultaneous chess on many tables. Sometimes certain tables are blocked, then one should try to make some progress on another table, like the regional table. And there are scholars who say the universal, mondial, global table is quite hopeless because of this system of regional hegemony. Let's try to at least improve it in our region. Now, as it happens, the North Atlantic region is the most peaceful region in world politics since 1945 because it has a system of more or less rule of law governments, democracies, which know it, is much, it makes much more sense to negotiate than to fight. The contribution of the European Union to this system is very large because it has abolished the intra West and Central European wars. Um, and this um, security community, as it is called, works even without a joint North Atlantic government. So it's an exception to the theory that one would need a world government, world federalism, to get peace. It can be done by voluntary integration and cooperation if the states are rule of law states and more or less democratic. And in this way, the old theory by the philosopher Immanuel Kant is correct. Uh, his book, Zum Ewigen Frieden, uh, tried to answer the question, is it really possible to have world peace? And he said, yes, if everybody becomes a, all states are republics. And he meant by the word republic, a democratic, rational governance system. So, progress is possible uh, by extending this security community. Um, and that brings some people to the idea we need to invite non-Western states to this security community because there are also non-Western democracies. Why should this security community be limited to the North American and European democracies. Why not invite several non-Western democracies to become part of it? Um, now, it depends on your criteria, how large you would like to make this idea. And the proponents of this idea call it a, a community of democracies. Interestingly, um, this idea is again and again uh, brought up by both the right wing and the left wing for different <coughs> reasons. Um, but it hasn't flown, it hasn't taken off. Uh, it has not uh, left the stage of interesting academic conferences, sometimes supported by uh, American presidents who want to leave a legacy. Uh, but they also objections against it, uh, like that, that will then become a club of democracies. Many other countries which are on the way to democracy feel excluded. It then becomes some form of discrimination. Uh, I don't think that's a valid argument. Um, to have, let's say, a gentleman's club may encourage others to become more gentlemanlike, because they want, of course, the, the, the status and the recognition of being a member of the club. So it may actually be an encouragement to introduce more legal order and democracy in a number of countries which are on their way. But one way or another, uh, the idea has not taken hold and uh, is not discussed in the newspapers, and you don't find it in political party programs. A country to invite would, for instance, be India. Then you would have the biggest democracy uh, as member of the club. Uh, India, of course, has serious problems. 
but it has a democratic constitution that has free political parties, it has a fairly free press, it has very serious poverty problems, but it has a democratic domestic political process. Another disadvantage of this idea of a, a community of democracies, what do you do when a country slides back and becomes authoritarian again? What has, has happened to the Council of Europe? Uh, what do you do with Russia? Member of the Council of Europe after some elections in the middle of the 1990s and then it becomes an authoritarian state and of course nobody has the guts to push it out because that leads to enormous revenge actions. So then you are stuck with uh, a non-democratic powerful member. Yes? This is kind of difficult, right? Because Russia is in name still a democracy. So then yes. you draw a line somewhere in very yes. gray area yeah. of authoritarian or what is it? It's, it's not so gray because uh, you have to define democracy well. And democracy is much more than having elections. You have fake democracies with regular elections. Illiberal democracies, they are called. And democracy is basically a system <coughs> of many power balances of many institutions which prevent that any particular group or institution becomes overpowering and falls for the temptation of abusing government power against the citizens and in favor of those in power. So it's democracy um, You need about eight or nine important features before you can really speak of a democracy. And we are all inclined to think that elections lead to democracy. They don't. They are necessary, a necessary ingredient, um, but you need much more. Um, you may have heard of the American political scientist Dow, uh, who's, who doesn't talk about democracy because he finds it a very conf confusing term. And he says it's propaganda. The, the, the North Korea calls itself the Democratic Republic of, of, of uh, Korea. Democracy is a polyarchy, a, mult a system of multiple government institutions which keep a check on each other, more than the trias politica. And I think that's a very useful way of looking at it because again and again we make the mistake after peace operations to think that once we organize elections we can leave a democracy behind. Not so. They fall to pieces immediately when the world community turns its back. Now on the regional scale we can do a lot, particularly as Europeans. Europe is the biggest source of development finance in the world, not because we are doing so much, but a lot we, uh, others are doing so little. On average, in the European Union, we spend, I think, about 0.4% of GMP on development assistance. And it's not always of the highest quality. It depends a little bit on the purposes uh, and, and the way things are uh, implemented. In general, the NGO development projects are better than the government development projects because NGOs, uh, the non-governmental organizations, can avoid corruption, which in many states is prevalent. And they can work next to or behind the back of a government. To some extent, of course, they are dependent on the conditions in a country which you find there when you enter with your projects. Um, many other regions try to build up institutions like the European Union, step by step. The European Union is very popular outside the, Euro the, the European Union area as a, an example for how you can settle your regional affairs. Then, of course, uh, we need to do much more in the field of controlling the arms race. Um, I indicated that already last time. We need, for instance, an organization to curb biological weapons. 
there is one on paper and it has an office in Geneva with one and a half person, but it doesn't inspect any country. Yes? Okay. Yeah. We urgently also need to take measures against cyber war because countries can be completely disrupted by um, cyber attacks. When Estonia and the Russian Federation had a, uh, a difficult emotional quarrel, the Secret Service in Russia organized 150 hackers from all over the world to paralyze Estonia for an entire week and the entire banking system. And modern um, technology will very much change the face of, uh, of war in the future. Um, war is not what many people think uh, a fist fight in the sense of the word that it's a physical confrontation. Modern war, as much in ancient war, is a combination of deceit, surprise, and great hard precision, not just massive strength. It is, the, the, the art in war is surprising your enemy, doing something he does not expect, um, creating beforehand the impression that something else will happen and do something entirely different and disrupt particularly the communications of the enemy. Now, by exploding a small nuclear weapon high in the atmosphere over another country will knock it blind and deaf because it will disrupt all electronic communications and make the country empty-handed. Um, it's just one example of what particular also space technology and also very precise small technology can be as part of modern and future war. You may have read about the so-called Stuxnet uh, virus, computer virus, in the confrontation between um, Iran in the time that it was still probably working to get nuclear weapons, and Israel and the United States. Uh, the entire system, the Siemens computer system in Iran, running the ultra centrifuge computers making highly uh, enriched uranium, uh, was all of a sudden paralyzed. And that was because a group, probably I'm speculating, of very smart Israeli and American computer scientists had designed a virus which disabled this Siemens computer system. And it was introduced simply by handing somebody in this system uh, a USB which uh, contained this uh, virus. So a very minute precision action. When <coughs> the government of Iran discovered that this had taken place, it appointed uh, a professor of uh, uh, cyber uh, studies to um, undo this. And on the way to his work, uh, someone on a motorcycle passed his car, put a bomb on the car, and that was the end of this professor. So it's nowadays, that, that's the point of, of my story, the, the physical confrontation between, also uh, between big powers is often a question of very precise, highly te technological and clandestine actions. That makes it less predictable, of course, uh, but this fits into the world that I sketched of large powers being very hesitant to have massive military confrontations, but it doesn't keep them from doing all kinds of small-scale, precise, clandestine <coughs> actions. On could, of course, try to lift certain regions of the world system out of the confrontation, like has happened with Antarctica. But um, that's very difficult because Antarctica used to be an almost empty space. We cannot do that with the North Pole because uh, it's very competitive and it has no landmass. The North Pole Arctic region is just ice and it is melting. So it's becoming 
Tappet Sea region. Then at the level of the citizens, there is, we can see of course, and that's one of the hopeful signs, that many people do not wait anymore for their governments to improve the world. International organizations can do a lot of good, but they are slow moving animals. To give them new tasks, often their treaties need to be changed and then everybody has to ratify the treaty before it is in power and parliaments have different views and one country or another has, uh, refuses to ratify so it, it takes many many years I talked already about the difficulty of reforming the World Bank and the IMF so why not take action yourself as an individual citizen a marvelous example is this uh, American lady who was fed up with the uh, constant uh, maiming of people by losing feet or hands and arms as a result of the small um, mines distributed in many countries. And she started as a private citizen an association to forbid these mines. And you think that is a hopeless struggle, it worked. She persevered, she convinced some NATO countries they could do without these mines, and then other NATO countries thought they didn't want to be in the corner of the bad guys, and one after another, and all of a sudden a big conference in Canada leading to a treaty to forbid them. after the United Nations, its disarmament committee, had met for 50 years on this subject and not achieved anything. Same applies to the growth of institutions like Amnesty. Amnesty International is the result of a British lawyer who got very angry about the fact that he read in the newspaper that two young Portuguese who had refused military service uh, faced um, I think the death penalty and we're going to be strangled against a pole and the, the knot at the pole was tightened and then uh, you uh, died uh, in, in the period, period that Portugal was still under uh, more or less fascist uh, uh, rule which is uh, some 30 years ago and he got so angry that he collected uh, other uh, yeah, like-minded people and started an organization to protect the political rights of individuals all over the world and report about it. That was the birth of Amnesty International and we have similar institutions like Human Rights Watch. And the interesting thing is we all as citizens can help these institutions particularly uh, by uh, spending time uh, as volunteers. Time is even more valuable than monetary donations. Um, the same applies to uh, actions like uh, those of Doctors Without Frontiers, the Red Cross, Save the Children, Action Aid, and you name it, you have it. Um, uh, there are, since the beginning of the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, there is a tremendous growth of private international organizations voluntary agencies as people uh, call them. And the interesting thing is you can establish one in an afternoon in the sense that you don't have the treaty provisions, you don't have the slow moving animals of states. If you want to do something about a particular terrible situation in the world you can go to a notary public, say I want a foundation, I have a number of friends, we have some money and we get started. And before you do that, you can even enter it all on the internet and simply start a Facebook page. Uh, though the, the possibilities for citizen action have increased tremendously. One of the important things is uh, to train free investigative journalists who expose abuse of power. Uh, it's a dangerous uh, profession to be an investigative journalist in a suppressive country. You have a high risk of uh, a traffic accident or something similar, uh, or disappear simply. Also in Europe, there are still people who disappear because their governments don't like them. 
Bielorussia makes journalists disappear. Um, there are many other countries. We know some cases in, uh, in the Russian Federation where a critical journalist was simply shot. And then some Chechens are arrested for having committed this crime. Well, people know that the Chechens have no particular reason to commit this crime. We as academics and students can do a lot. Uh, item number six, universities, of course, can teach, uh, can do research. Just exposing reality and uh, reporting to it, uh, on it, is very important. Like the tables I showed, uh, like the studies by the Fund for Peace, gives us a better idea of what happens. And I may have mentioned the previous time that also uh, modern um, satellite equipment makes it possible to see things which we used not to see by reconnaissance over North Korea, the forced labor camps there, uh, or in Darfur, where no journalist can enter anymore. We can see from the sky if you rent equipment, and some universities do it, or this, or peace institutes, or, or NGOs, and report on what happens. And all these international NGOs can, of course, act more strongly by working together. And uh, because there are thousands of them, I would be very happy to see that they form an alliance and make interventions before the summits of major governments. And that the major governments getting together in the G7 or the G20, the group of 20 biggest financial states, uh, have a meeting asked for by these NGOs. If they ask it, it's very difficult to refuse. Put things on their agenda and ask afterwards in the press conference and what did you do about it? It helps a little bit. One cannot expect miracles, but in the world of simultaneous chess, you have to use every chess board that you can find where you can move even a little chess piece in the right direction. Now this brings us also to business, not to forget business. We have uh, social corporate responsibility, uh, which is usually um, still the subject of voluntary implementation. Um, it would be good to incorporate it in national legislation. And of course, shareholders can hold their corporations also to account, and journalists can report on the abuse of their economic or technological power. Um, an important and often underestimated area to help improve things is assist and train free trade unions. In many countries there are trade unions which eat out of the hand of the government and they are part of the power structure. And they are a way of suppressing really the working population and they are very afraid of speaking up. Um, the Dutch trade unions have been encouraged by uh, the political parties and fi with finance from the development aid budget to help train trade unions abroad. You may have read that uh, in uh, the former Rhodesia, um, the, the dictator uh, in Zimbabwe uh, has really destroyed much of his country's socio-economic fabric, uh, and that the opposition um, in this country has gradually become stronger. The opposition leader was trained uh, by Dutch trade unions to become an effective trade union leader. Now, it's very difficult in a country like that because you risk your own life. His wife died in a car accident. Um, Tsvang Girai, his name is. Um, I don't know how influential he is nowadays because it's a play of chess in Zimbabwe of the 
current leadership against uh, the only small opposition party which is linked to one of the trade unions. But it helps at least to keep the flame burning of uh, belief in democracy and rule of law. It's a kind of development assistance which is also very much in our own economic self-interest. What is better than training trade unions uh, in countries which are accused of unfair comp competition against uh, the products that are made in Europe because of extremely poor payment of their own laborers. You help these people and you also help correct serious imbalances in the world economic system. So this is an underestimated area of international cooperation, helping to train free trade unions. We as consumers can also do a lot by agreeing massively on not to buy certain products. Some idealistic organizations advocate that. When we are in the supermarket, we are inclined to look for the cheapest chicken uh, and uh, not for <laughs> the environmentally uh, uh, more and, and according to animal health regulations, uh, better product. Um, but you can organize a lot of publicity and pressure, public pressure, one of the funny things that, for instance, Oxfam Novib in the Netherlands did was uh, organize in December the activities of um, the, the Green Santa Claus, who walked into labor markets, in, into, uh, into uh, uh, stores uh, and the large chains of consumer products, and then very angri angrily this, this Green Santa Claus, Santa Claus um, threw away all the chocolates uh, which were not according to fair trade standards and not paying the farmers the proper amount for their products. And in the beginning it, uh, it organized quite uh, a bit of unrest, but this was great fun of course for the journalists and uh, this organization was smart enough to always take camera with them and be in the news. And one after another, all the big consumer change changed and promised to only have fair trade chocolate, with a very small exception, the prize fighters at the bottom of the market. It's just an example to show that consumer power, if well organized, can work, particularly in the case of if it's criminally traded goods, like blood diamonds. There are always, if you have a good system against blood di diamonds, black marketeers who earn a lot by selling the blood diamonds anyway and changing uh, the, uh, the origin marks, yes? Yes. There is not yet a formal boycott in the European Union of products from the Palestinian areas in Israel. The idea is that at least uh, those products made in the Palestinian areas, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, by Israeli companies and sold as Israeli products, but made by Palestinians and using Palestinian resources, should be labeled not as Israeli but as Palestinian products so that the consumer knows this is not from the legal area of Palestine of, of Israel but it comes from Palestine and from occupied territory. Israel is furious uh, because this um, of course hurts uh, one of the nerves uh, and for them the large exports to uh, to the European Union are very essential. Americans are furious about this, um, this measure and it's a, it's a very weak beginning of a consumer boycott in favor of international law because international law says you may not exploit the economic resources of an occupied territory. to 
advocate for the strict boycott of Israel. Because they say that it's an economic pressure and we are not in war with Israel, so we are not supposed to boycott no. That's a particular interpretation. I mean, a boycott is not a, a measure which is limited to war situations. Uh, th that's an interpretation then in France. Um, and that interpretation, I would say, limits consumer freedom. Because if you as a uh, consumer um, prefer to eat Moroccan oranges uh, rather than Palestinian oranges uh, exported by an Israeli co company, you should have the freedom to do so. Um, yes? Blood diamonds. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. It's not a waterproof system, the labeling of diamonds as not being blood diamonds. It's a labeling system. But it's an interesting example of what is possible. Here the initiative was taken by a South African diamond company, the Kimberley Mines, because it hurt their self-interest and their finances that there were so many blood diamonds on the world market. So they took the so-called idealistic step of introducing a labeling system. And you as a consumer, when you uh, buy a diamond uh, for your spouse, can ask for the certificate of origin. Um, now, any such system also invites black marketeers, but it does work to some extent. Yeah. And I think there are many more possibilities in this area. Because many wars are financed by trade. Many wars in Africa are wars also in which militias, paid for by foreign extractive companies, play a big role. This thing, your cell phone, contains many civil wars in Africa. Um, because it, it needs precious metals from the Congo and, and war areas. Um, and you can buy nowadays a war-free cell phone, <laughs> uh, which is made in such a way that this is avoided. Um, but such things have to be done massively, of course, will, uh, in order to get a real effect. And the point of this slide is that it is possible. Possible is also to have much better measures for taxation. <coughs> to give you one example, just in the European Union, fraudulent taxation activities in the field of value added cost us as consumers 100 billion euros a year. And that is low risk, very clever, white color financial work writing fraudulent invoices from company A to company B and then uh, saying to your Ministry of Finance that you have paid in Germany, for instance, so much value added tax and you also have paid it in the Netherlands, so you claim it back. And you get it back because it's according to the rules. And you don't even have to whitewash this money because you get it from the Ministry of Finance. One hundred billion dollars a year. I was told by uh, specialists from Europol who try to investigate this. Um, now the total turnover of the cocaine and heroin trade in the, in the world is about the same. And that's a very dangerous trade with high risks of, as a cocaine or heroin trader, uh, getting 
getting killed in the competition against <coughs> these gangs. So um, there are still many areas also in um, uh, avoiding, legally avoiding taxation that can be improved. And, and so uh, according to point E, the, the, the objection that you often hear that certain measures which are necessary cannot be paid for and there is no money, that objection is not right. There's money enough in the world, but it's spent on different purposes. And the estimate of the United Nations of the um, illegal money laundering transactions in the world is that it is at least four or five percent of global GNP. Then we are talking about thousands of billions. Now to compare with the total sum of development assistance in the world is about 140 billion a year. And only half of that is really development assistance, according to certain studies. So there are tremendous possibilities to get finance to the proper goals if we fix this enormous leak in the system with which the Netherlands cooperates very happily. Because we have uh, a system where you can register as a Dutch holding company and pay 25% of taxes or even less. And all that you do is have one board meeting a day, uh, one board meeting a year. That means a dinner at Schiphol Airport. And you play by the rules and um, there are ways to do it even cheaper. Uh, you have read about uh, uh, international corporations which hardly pay any taxes. And this means that there is also enormous exploitation of weak states in the financial sphere. These countries in the fragile state index usually have no decent tax service. They don't know what goes on, they cannot implement their regulations and they lose billions and billions of dollars a year to the smart guys and the smart corporations and the big financial centers. So even though tax seems to have nothing to do with the subject of uh, our evenings here, it has very much to do with it because you can finance a lot of good things that help correct the world if you have decent tax legislation and good implementation. Uh, what should we do because it's all ready Almost nine, ten. Shall we have a brief break? Yeah, and, and then, or shall we return? I promised you much more discussion. I haven't kept my promise. Let me, perhaps it's better if you don't agree that we simply go on. Yeah? My suggestion is. Yeah, okay. Then the final slide. What can we do at the national and political level? Um, advocate the measures that we discussed. Choose the right political party. Uh, that's up to everybody, him or herself. Political parties are getting very unpopular. Hardly anybody joins a political party because we think democracy is something that is given to us and we don't have to do anything for it. Um, we can, if we don't like political parties, become active in an NGO of your own choice. Animal welfare, poverty alleviation, human rights, um, there are thousands of them also in the Netherlands. And we have lots of time. Many people think they have no time. But the average Dutch citizen watches television for 23 hours a week. Now, not all of that is news documentaries. <coughs> uh, and not all of that is useful for us to function as a democratic citizen. A lot of it is, let's be honest, a waste of time. So if you want to take up these possibilities which are there, there's plenty of time. Uh, my calculation is that we have at least a day and a half a week to devote to voluntary activities uh, for whatever you want. Same applies to lack of money. There's an interesting study by a, a young British philosopher who teaches at um, Oxford University, Toby Ort. I recommend you look up his, uh, his site. Toby Ort says, I'm a young academic. 
I and my wife live very happily on a modest income. We have a little bit more to spend now than in our student period, uh, but life is very pleasant. Let's freeze it. And let us, my wife and I, devote the coming income increases, which we get, whether we want it or not, <laughs> Let's devote it to good causes. And he calculated, in this way, I can donate more than a million pounds in my lifetime, calculating on the basis of average statistical life expectancy. That's not something that occurs to us immediately, but it's possible. So I've cut this promise to one third and say at least half a million euros. He calculated a million pounds, British pounds, for himself. The advantage is it's tax deductible. It lowers also your income tax. And Tommy Orr did other things that are interesting as a philosopher. He calculated what is the most effective contribution to improving life, peace or health or food or whatever. And effectiveness, he calculates, in this sense, what is the impact of a particular intervention on all of these areas on life expectancy of the beneficiaries? How many additional human lives, life years, do I create by doing A or B or C? And the conclusion of his, he has big tables of what it costs to do something and his conclusion is the best thing to do is buy dewarming pills for children. They cost nothing and they have a tremendous effect on life expectancy. Because many kids die soon after birth because of intestinal diseases. Um, so he has interesting uh, non-conventional conclusions. Toby Ord. So I think in this fashion, with voluntary time, with uh, donations, with activities, with our minds, we can all pay a decent rent for being on Spaceship Earth for a whole lifetime. Let me stop now and see what your thoughts are.